Welcome to a very special In Conversation presentation from the New Classical FM and Zoomer Media. My name is Mark Wigmore. Thank you for joining us. Robert Lepage is our guest for over 40 years. He's been sharing his expansive imagination with us as a director, actor, producer, and playwright, first in Quebec and then as an international sensation. His storytelling approach often makes use of multimedia and new technologies, and there's no version of visual theatrical storytelling he hasn't explored. Film and television, theater and opera, rock and roll concerts, the circus, and more recently, the new frontier of immersive visuals and virtual reality. His company, Ex Machina, in Quebec City has been something of a dream factory for nearly 30 years. His team building experiences that have been enjoyed all over the world. In 2015, he debuted an immersive scenographic and virtual experience titled The Library at Night to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Montreal's Grand Bibliothèque. It has since been to Quebec City, Europe, South America, and can be enjoyed in Toronto from March 10th through April 18th, 2022. Library at Night is a presentation of Lighthouse Immersive and Luminato Festival Toronto. It is a real pleasure to welcome Robert Lepage to the new Classical FM and Zoomer Media. Welcome. Great pleasure being here. Great to be with you. Could you have imagined the tools you would have been working with uh, <laughs> here in 2022? 40 years ago, you were a young actor, director. Mm -hmm. I always feel like you were ahead of the curve with these technologies, so maybe you could mm -hmm. have imagined what you'd be. Well, not really, because uh, the things that very early on in my work, I, I like to play with any kind of little gadget that was on the market right. and try to squeeze poetry out of it or storytelling or whatever. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, and I never could imagine that the tools that would be uh, invented by then would, would be tools that would bring you into uh, uh, another kind of experience like uh, choosing where you look <laughs> right. when you're being told the story and, and things like that. So, so uh, no, I, I, I leave these, um, the people who, invite, who invent new uh, New types of painting or something. I, I, I let them. I let them invent the, the, the tool or, or the, the the material, and I, I like to kind of play around and turn it turn it on its head. You know, every time I see something you've dreamed up or produced, my mind expands, and with the possibilities of what the audience experience can be, it is. I, we're going to be seeing some of the images in the background here, but uh, Stravinsky's Nightingale with the COC, Ka, I think the best, best Cirque du Soleil show I've seen, which was in Las Vegas, Needles and Opium here in Toronto, 887, uh, with you on stage, welcoming us to your childhood, looking at moments from the ring cycle with the Met, watching the Peter Gabriel Secret World Tour on television. Is it dream it, imagine it, and somehow it will come to life? Is that, <laughs> is that how it works? Well, not really, because people think you have a plan. You know, people think from the start that you uh, you have a vision and that you're going to follow that vision. Of course, you have some ideas, and, and but you, you uh, I, I never know what I'm going to do. Really, I, I, I like the show or the the object I'm working on to kind of present itself to, to me and to explain to me what the rules are. Um, I admire artists who take five years of their life and they know exactly and they do the drawings and they say this is how it's going to be and they, and that's fine. And, and a lot of filmmakers are like that. You know, everything has to be storyboarded and everybody. Everything has to be uh, um, priced and, and you know measured. That that level of meticulousness. Yeah, right. and that's why I'm unhappy in filmmaking because when I, the few f films that I've done, because you, the thing turns out to look like you had expected, and I think that life is more exciting when you're driving on a highway and suddenly there's extraordinary scenery on the left, and you take that exit, and, and you take a chance to go see, and then you, you discover this whole new world. And, and so if you want to be innovative, or if you want, it's not something that you decide I'm going to be innovative. You, you are because you say, well, why don't we turn, why don't we take this exit? And, and uh, very often, for example, in filmmaking, I end up in this amazing scenery. Everything was planned, everything is built for the shot, and everything has been conceived. But then it's much more interesting if you turn the camera around and nobody on the set wants to do that. You know, <laughs> and you have all these people who say, no, 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 no. So, uh, so that's why I like to work in, in, the, in the performance world because it's, more, it's freer. You, 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 you can do that kind of thing. You could decide very, very close to the opening that, you know what, let's do exactly the contrary. And, I think that, and, and the process was just a way to bring you to that place. It's interesting. You work with Denis Villeneuve's brother. Uh, mm. Yeah, Martin. Films, yeah, and Martin, and yeah. uh, 
I, I would imagine Denis has to be pretty specific. Absolutely, and that's the thing that's so extraordinary about Martin is that he's exactly the opposite. <laughs> You're like, I'll go with the other one. Uh, yeah, 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 I like working with him. He's very creative and right. it's very spontaneous. It's, it's what happens there on the set, and, and so I'm, I'm happier that way. This being said, I do admire people and I do envy people like Denis Villeneuve who are so, who know what they want and get it, but I, I'd have the impression of being uh, uh, not deceived, but to be disappointed at the end of the process if it's exactly what you had planned. Right. I, I mean, as a creative person, what allowed you to open that valve to say, we want to represent something to the audience, mm -hmm. so let's try something that's rarely been done or, mm -hmm. or, or never been done or never mm -hmm. been seen at a performance? Yeah. Because I think that takes a, a certain level of confidence and gumption to, mm -hmm. to just even go down that road at all. Yeah. But uh, you, you judge it by the level of excitement in the room with the, the, the artist and the creative. Uh, That's your love of theater too, is that instant reaction. And yeah, it's, it's, it's what happens in, 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 I mean, you, you do something and then say, well, how do we solve this? And, and, and most original uh, creativity comes from solving a, a problem, trying to untangle a snag or something. That's always where the great, you know, the great soliloquies in Hamlet are obviously created because there's very long set changes going on behind, right? right. And it's always that. I mean, really, if you really study... That was the function. That was the function. Sure. Well, where, where are you in your, in, your, uh, in your line? Okay, so go and just say to be or not to be, and that's where the character, <laughs> while we were, you know, we're prepared, right. all the soldiers of Fort and Brass have to change in, right. in, into the party guests, whatever. So it's always that. So that's what happens uh, in the rehearsal room. We're creating all these things, and then you go, well, how do we solve this? Why don't we do this? And people say, we can't do that, but why can't we do that? Well, because it ha hasn't been done, it's not in, in the vocabulary. Well, what vocabulary? And then, and then you, you try to push away the the, uh, uh, the barriers and the and the rules, and you say, well, if it feels good, and and by the reaction in the room, with with, with uh, not with the audience, but with the other creators, they say, you know, this feels good. This feels, uh, you know, like a nice poetic moment, a, a nice poetic solution. Very often, these solutions are the most interesting moments of the of the performance. Let's talk about uh, the library at night, mm -hmm. and, and I'll start by asking, what was your first run-in with a virtual reality headset, uh -huh. and, and did the wheels just start turning right yeah. away once you experienced that? I think I was with my brother in a basement, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know no, what your first yeah. experience I was. I never, ever tried any of these things. I never thought it was for me. For me, it was just like a gadget. It was for video games or something like that. Right. So I was never really, really interested. But in they it. did have those ones where you could be in a forest or in yeah. whatnot. <laughs> They were always very, you know, disappointing right, okay. and all that. You know, I think that the whole uh, thing came when uh, the, the, uh, the library of, uh, at night, it's not just about libraries and the content of the books. It's not just about reading. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's um, the book is about the experience of the library, what it is, just the presence, being present in a library at night. Right. So, so that's why I, very early on I said, well, we're not just going to, it was supposed to be an exhibition where we kind of, you know, put books on and have references of different uh, libraries and pictures and, and uh, multimedia push buttons and things like that. And I said, it has to be something people experience. And certainly in, in a, at a moment where people are going less and less to libraries, uh, to kind of, you have to, to remind them that a library is not just a place where it's written silence on the wall. It, it is something, it's something sensuous about going to a library. So that meant uh, doing some kind of virtual uh, experience and, and the only thing available at the time was that uh, because now there's uh, augmented reality and there's all right. these other gadgets around but, right. but then at the time it was virtual reality and I remember in the early days um, it was a very very cumbersome big helmet you'd put on your head with a very long uh, pigtail kind of wire that was in your head would suddenly kind your of head <laughs> was weighted in a certain absolutely way. Yeah, and right. but it was interesting because in the first year or year and a half of development of the project that technology evolved so quickly you know, it went from the, this kind of almost like a... Uh, uh, Buck, Buck Rogers helmet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, then it became like a, almost a cardboard box. And sure. eventually the, <laughs> right. the, 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 the wire was off and it was uh, wireless. And eventually it became like just like a little iPhone that you put on, your, on a pair of glasses. You know, right. basically. So, so it was nice to um, experience that thing for the first time as it was evolving, as it was also find it, finding its vocabulary. It mu must have also meant, too, that you could, instead of putting books on a set, uh -huh. 
that you could dream up the most elaborate Absolutely. Or, or, or whatever type of library you wanted. Absolutely, that's because beautiful. that was the thing that in, in this, uh, well, it, it was actually uh, created for the, the 10th anniversary of the Grand Bibliothèque in Montreal, so we were limited to 10 experiences. And of course, uh, Alberta was a book has about 40,000 libraries, <laughs> famous libraries, and you go, okay, we have to bring it down. And after the first uh, brainstorm we did with Alberto, he left us with a list of 150 libraries. And for him, it was a huge breakdown. He said, no, we need 10, Alberto, we need 10. <laughs> right. So eventually we, we thought, okay, um, it's important that we have uh, almost all uh, continents represented, also uh, periods, very, you know, there's like a Baroque one, and this one that's a very recent one, and this one is more from the Victorian age and all that, and to have imaginary ones too, because uh, the book is also about uh, Captain Nemo's uh, library in, in uh, the Nautilus, in the Jules Verne, uh, I think in English it's 20 leagues right, under the, the seas or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so we had to invent some. And also the Alexandria, uh, the famous Alexandria, well, the famous, people don't even know, they don't know for sure if it really existed. It's like a big myth. Uh, but there is one today. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a library in Alexandria that's very modern, very beautiful, and all that. We went to shoot, but we had to leave because there was a, a Muslim Brother demonstration, and we had to leave. To, so unfortunately, we did not right. <laughs> get the to do that. So were the asked the Quebecers were asked to kind of uh, <laughs> rent a taxi for the day. And, and, sure. and so, so, so we had to kind of create uh, um, the, the mythical one. Uh, which is as interesting, right? And, uh, yeah, you know, which so, is I, I think that apparently burnt and, and it was a, uh, did not everybody kind of argues where exactly it was in Alexandria and all that. So, so, so that, that's why it was interesting for us. It, it, we had to use a lot of imagination because some of them don't exist anymore. We had to recreate them. Some of them never really existed. Some of them are fictionist. The, the Atlantis from... of libraries. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, inspired by Argentinian Canadian writer, a friend of yours, Alberto mm -hmm. Manguel, uh, mid 2000s book, writer, translator, editor, mm -hmm. language in words, his absolute passion. And uh, the, the takeaway is that the library says a lot about the person or the, the people uh -huh. behind it, right? The history, the curation, yeah, yeah. the prejudice, the personal tastes, how the library is positioned and presented. It's a wonderful launch point and, uh, and as you say, the library not in in modern society, not mm -hmm. used in the same way it was, no. but a wonderful launch point to sort of look into the soul of absolutely. of these spaces. And so that was a lot to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Because we, we uh, you know, I don't go to libraries anymore myself. Right. right. But but the, I I love these buildings. And what was what what's the charm? What's the uh, uh, what, some of, some libraries are, are completely bewitching, and, and why is that? So it was an opportunity for me to also kind of uh, dig into that. And uh, and, the, and now uh, libraries, you can reinvent the purpose of a library. You wonder why are people, now that everything's online, or almost everything's online, uh, why build a new library, a new, a new city library? It, 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 there's something about, it becomes more of a cult and, and, and um, a church-like kind of thing. And, and one, one example is, uh, the uh, University of Copenhagen library that we have is just a, a, a wonderful, beautiful architectural masterpiece from the 19th, mid 19th century uh, where Hans Christian Andersen would hang out. Right. And uh, so uh, the thing that's interesting about that library is that it's the first official library filled with dead books. The books are officially dead. Out of so print. they're all, well, they're real books, right. but you can't you can't have access to them, oh, they're there. So right. you go, okay, so they've kept them for uh, heritage reasons, but no, they're, they're there almost like uh, sacrosanct objects. They participate to the acoustic, the particular acoustic of the right. place. You can't remove a single book. Uh, so you see people with laptops and they go there and all that, and you, you understand, you have to go and do the experience and you understand how the place is, is filled with ghosts. There's a place, it's, 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 so it's, so it's beyond the act of reading. And, and for me, that was the interesting thing. When you, you, you ask yourself, what is a library for besides borrowing books and, and uh, uh, bringing them back late? You know, what's, what's, what's... So, so for example, there was the, the one we shot in Mexico, which is the most recent one, the Vasconcelos one. Um, it's a very modern place, very, very, very uh, modern art, very noisy, and you always, it's noisy. Was it? Because it's a cultural center. People go there to do things. Right. Uh, of course, to consult books, and, and it's extremely well done. And you, you can find some kind of place where you can concentrate and have a bit of peace and quiet. But you, you have these 
uh, huge panes of, of glass everywhere where young kids uh, do these uh, little bands and they do choreographies and they use them as mirrors. And have so it's a very, very, um, it's a place that's alive. Right. And, and when you think of libraries now, you think of these kind of old Victorian uh, hard hair rule places. And, and, and now it's, it's kind of changing, it's evolving. I like that idea that you know some of these spaces are, inspire us mm -hmm. to want to learn. Mm -hmm. and like you say, it's almost a religious experience, and so uh, um, we're able to connect with that energy. Or it's a place to come and create and mm -hmm. and network and absolutely be yeah. creative and, be, and 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 be artistic, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. Um, so you take these ideas and this book, and in 2015. You say, we want to make this immersive VR experience. So what was the creative bridge uh -huh. that you had to, to look at this book and say, OK, here's well, what I want people to see mm -hmm. in Quebec City and Toronto now? Yeah. Well, uh, it's, I, I think that it's, um, you know, there's, something, there's nothing more universal than reading. You know, it's, it's extremely universal. And, and you, um, it's interesting when you compare um, something local, let's, let's say the, the Ottawa, the parliament in Ottawa, the, the, the legal library, uh, with uh, something that, that comes from the ancient times or, or like a Baroque library in, in, in Austria. And you compare that and you say, it's the same thing. It's, 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 the, this, this, uh, it's a place of memory. It's a place of, uh, where you keep uh, sacred things, uh, special things. Uh, there are books you could just pick off and take off the, the shelf and the, there's some that you don't have access to that you have to put gloves on and you have to be connected and you have people who open a special drawer so there's that all over the world and, and that's I think is very ex exciting and, and it's universal and and it's um, it's what goes on in people's brains w when you go there I, I don't know if you you've seen you know this extraordinary uh, movie by Wim Wenders, uh, Wings of Desire, I think it is in English. Okay. Yeah. And there's this cathedral of books uh, where, where uh, the angels in that movie actually walk by pedestrians and you hear them, you hear their thoughts and all that. And then right. eventually they go right. into this, the library, the central library of Berlin, and you hear like this symphony of thoughts and of imagination. And that's really where this is, that's exactly where it, all, all the thoughts converge. and. and uh, so it reconciles you with that idea that you don't necessarily have to be surfing the web for that, right. that, that there's, there are places where, where thoughts are gathered. We're going to have a brief look. This is a moment from the library mm -hmm. at night. Not only a library, but a library at night, and you've had all these experiences visiting mm -hmm. these places around the world. I mean, as, as you're starting to experience it now, here five years later after first mm -hmm. showing it, or, or, or longer than that, seven years, uh, are, are you feeling like you, you found that translation? Obviously, you want to add magic beyond mm -hmm. uh, those, those library experiences, and you want to mm -hmm. add a story and so on, but there is that initial feeling that you took away while you were visiting those mm -hmm. places. Are you feeling like, is the feedback saying that you've 
tapped into that through this? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. It's just that you want to get people's attention on things. Uh, you're, you're, let's say you're the director, so you say, we want them to understand this about this thing. So you try to guide their, their, their gaze to a certain place. And they do, you see them on their chair and they, they look at that. But a lot of people go exactly the opposite. Right. And that's where it gets interesting. So right. well, what, what, what are you looking what's at? What's over here? What's, what's that? What were they looking at? And, then you, and we have ways of knowing what people were looking at all that. And you see that it's about something completely different. And that's what I think is exciting is that the, the, um, we were hoping that it would be a, a 3D experience. You're in the middle of this thing, and people would kind of probably go a bit like this, a bit like this, a bit when you guide them to do That's that. That's right, guiding their do. focus. But some people go, and some people <laughs> also, you'd think they'd go and visit the 10 libraries, but some of them just stay hooked on the same library and uh, over and over and over, and they go back and it replays for them. So, 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 um, so it's much more, um, it's multifaceted more than we thought it would be. There's, there's something about it that, that um, there's a fruition that came with it that I didn't, I didn't expect. I, we, we thought we, it would be a very controlled message, and it's not at all. Well, it, <laughs> on the it contrary, sounds, it sounds exactly what you would like. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, and Alberto uh, Mangua lived here in Toronto for yeah. 20 years. So mm -hmm. uh, nice to share it here in Toronto. Nice Absolutely. To yeah. To this part of his life, and you two had a friendship. He wrote about yeah. you. Yeah. That feels like that could have gone either way, depending yeah. <laughs> on what he had written. But I guess it was the profile piece. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Alberto was a very close friend uh, during the days he was in Toronto because I, in my first performances here, he he did reviews and he, he was a cultural uh, reporter for the the English CBC and then for Saturday Night and all that. So, and he, you know, he lived in this tiny little house in Cabbage Town, and I, we used to hang out. And eventually he went to Europe and I lost touch with him and became this very famous writer and this important literary figure and all that. And I said, right. he probably forgot about me completely. And eventually he gave me a call. I was in London doing a show. And he said, hey, how you doing? And it was the same good Alberto. And I actually, I'm one of the rare people who had a chance to see that famous library at night. He has this extraordinary library of 30,000 books with very rare books and all that. And they're all kind of positioned in a certain way. And if you want to know who Alberto is, you walk into that room at night and, and you see the guilty pleasure right. of what it is to have that. And of course, and unfortunately, at one point, he, he had to move around and, and that those 30,000 books ended up in, in crates and just kind of was scattered around the world for a while. And now he's in, uh, he's in Portugal and, and he's found a place to rebuilt his library, which is kind like of the ultimate thing. literary man yeah. cave that yeah. he's got yeah, going yeah. On, on there. But, but, but something I think people should know about, about uh, Alberto is, uh, you know, he's very coy, he doesn't say everything. But Al Alberto's interest in, in, uh, in literature uh, came from when he was, I think he was 16, and he was a delivery boy in Buenos Aires, and, and he would deliver books to, uh, to Borges. And Borges would ask him to, uh, to because his eyesight was right. so bad, would say, well, can you read me this book? Or, uh, so, so that's where his interest uh, into the literary thing came. And he would read books for Borges. Can you imagine? You're 16 and you're... And he wrote a small book about that. In French, it's called Chez Borges, uh, at Borges' place. I don't know what it is in English. And it's just the relationship of this you know, young Alberto and this uh, older uh, grandmaster. And I said, you should write a play from this, and if ever you do, I will stage it, I promise. So he wrote to me uh, last year, he says, you know, I'm thinking about it, I have some ideas. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm having you? a meeting about a meeting. <laughs> a meeting. Yeah, exactly. Right. But uh, yeah, so, but he's, he's, he's a very extraordinary uh, and, and sensuous guy, and that's what that's so, so uh, endearing about him, is that the literary world is often perceived as intellectual and cold and analytic and all that. And of course, he, he's very analytic, he's an, a great intellectual, but, but he's very sensuous about everything. And, and that's why it was important for us to do a, a sensuous experience about libraries and reading. Yes, obviously, he felt very passionate about his own mm -hmm. library and all these other yeah, yeah. libraries and be able to Absolutely. somehow Absolutely. take that. So, yeah. so we see the characters and, and mm -hmm. actors and in the film sense, a lot of technology to bring this story to the audience at one uh, Young Street Lighthouse Immersive. And it feels like you're, you're utilizing skills from other parts of your career, film and technology. Mm -hmm. So this is, is one step. Do you see the, the tech somehow being brought into live theater more so because you know we're going we're we're being immersed mm -hmm. we're putting on our headsets there's yeah. no live actors and so on but mm -hmm. uh, i'm wondering about melding those two 
Yeah. World well, I think together. we have to go there. I mean, mm -hmm. the thing is that even if we resist, we, we, ha we have to go there. Right. There's, a, there's a thing where, uh, and, and what's inviting is that the, the technologies uh, are forcing us or are inviting us to do it. Uh, it used to be that somebody who would do film editing and sound editing would be, or, or, or f f film lighting would be f a completely different world than the stage world of performing arts. And now these objects are the same, more or less. You know, it's, it's the, the digital world kind of uh, democratized all, all of the, the tools. So, so it's easier to have these two worlds, the recorded world and the performance world, the live world, to kind of speak to each other and try to do things. So, and that's where we're heading. Bionic theater is not bionic theater, but but uh, s s something that has the best of both worlds, I right. think. And and there's all sorts of different attempts. And certainly during the pandemic, there was a lot of theater on the web and on the Zoom. And I saw a lot of really really crappy stuff. But there's a couple of things I saw that were really cool. I went, right. okay. So you know, the, uh, necessity is you know, it's a big cliche, but necessity is, is the mother of invention. And and I saw some really really cool theater on the web live, but using. Um, the Zoom techniques or, that were available and the, high, the iPhones or whatever the, the poor means that people had to communicate what they had to say. And, and so, so you have to be s sensitive to that and, and you have to accept that that's where, that's where performing arts uh, and uh, recorded media is going. So from that inventive time during the pandemic and, and what you've done mm -hmm. here with this, is, is that, I mean, that's where it's going. Yeah. We, we've yeah. figured that much out, but is it exciting? Yes, it is very, very, very exciting. Yeah. I, th I think it is. I think that th what, what, what we have to remember about this, that in the theater very often, uh, is that let's say we do a play in the Senate Sarajevo during the war. So fine, we sit down, we do research, we look at films and blah, blah, blah. blah. We speak to somebody who's done the war, whatever. We do our research and we do the play. And we think we're informed enough to do it. We do a project like this one, uh, Library at Night, and you have to go to Sarajevo. Of course, you read about it before, and you have to, but you have to go there. And when you go there, it is something else. Right. And the experience is something, and the traces of the war are still there. You know, and, I mean, it could go on for hours and hours about Sarajevo. So you go, you know what? What we had planned cannot be what we had planned. It has to, it has to be modified. So, so that's part of the, I think, the, the, the film world is more about reality and about uh, trying to show the real thing. And, and, and theater is more concerned with the poetic uh, aspect of it. One needs the other. One can't survive without the other. Um, how are you experiencing uh, culture right now? Everybody's been through a lot. The mm -hmm. pandemic, very hard on the arts world, mm -hmm. as you said. Uh, Absolutely. Plenty of, plenty of uh, shutdowns, plenty of garbage produced, <laughs> yeah, limited yeah, tools. But, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, the new theater <laughs> you launched in Quebec was certainly uh -huh. affected. Um, yeah. But there's also this massive sea change happening in culture protests, mandates, canceling, social media, mm -hmm. echo chambers. Absolutely. It's very noisy. It's mm -hmm. really ramped up over the last yeah. five years. You, uh -huh. You're no stranger to talking about criticism, uh -huh. being Absolutely. criticized and so on. Uh, it feels almost paralyzing sometimes, but mm -hmm. I, I'm curious. But it does, it's the speed at in. which things are changing. I think that is paralyzing. Other than that, I'm, I'm open for change. I'm open to change how I view things and, 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 and to learn. Right. Uh, and, and of course- And we, you've always been that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're clumsy in our attempts to, to, we want to be helpful and we're clumsy and we do these goops and we do all these things. And, and I'm ready to recognize, you know, my wrongs and all that, but the things, things are going so quickly, so fast, you know? Uh, so, so, so that's so the concern, is the speed. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 you say, yeah, okay, so I, I agree. So maybe we have to change how we do things a bit or we have to adapt, but how do we let us the time to do it? But then still there's, an, there's, a, there's a new uh, parameter, there's a new way of looking, and you're stuck in all these things and all that. So, so maybe now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an old, <laughs> I'm an old crooner now. Right. I'm not a, sure. uh, I mean, I still have a lot of energy, but uh, uh, you know, for me to process all of that, I go, okay, well, continue to do stuff at your pace and eventually you'll find a space. But I think there's a, the speed at which all that information is coming and, and the, the different uh, positions, on the, you know, it's become like this big uh, whirlwind of, of, of uh, and, and it's, and it's, it's could be very, very tricky because then after that you've, you've casted the play, then people say, no, you shouldn't cast like that. You should, well, what do you mean? I can't right, cast. so you had so some then you specific uh, oh, problems over oh, the last uh, 
couple of years mm -hmm. with Slav Kanata and so on, people were very vocal about your decisions. You did manage mm -hmm. to stage things, uh, or at least one. And, and I mean, was that a different experience for you this time around mm -hmm. or, or over this last couple of years to the 10 years prior? Was it more intense? Well, the thing, well yeah, I mean, of course it was, it was a different experience, except that the pandemic kind of froze all of that. Right. <laughs> So you go, okay, so now we're back to, to, to where we were. But uh, uh, no, I mean, that's, that's the thing also, is that people have to, there's this kind of, um, uh, people see uh, artists as if we're, we're all coming from the same place, the same country, with the same morals. With them. And it's not true. We all come from, we've all been educated differently. We all have come from different social backgrounds. Some of us are women, some of us are men. And now we have to recognize there's also people who are not women or men. And right. so, so all of that, uh, all these differences uh, are expressed in our work, and sometimes they're expressed in a clumsy way. Sometimes they're expressed in a in a shocking way, even though you know you never wanted to shock. Uh, and and you come from where you you come from, so people have to accept that they have to, before you criticize somebody. It's okay. Where does this person come from? What's that culture about? Was it? Empathy, so, I believe, is well, yeah, but right. you, you have to otherwise, because certainly in in, in the the whole First Nations and 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 and, and the slave experience and all that, it's. Uh, the, people have different uh, sensitivities if you're from Western Canada, Central Canada, or, or Eastern Canada. Sure. It's three radically, radical different positions. So depending where you come from, who you know, what your project was about, it's, it's, you're not going to have a unified voice on any of this. So, so th that's why I'm saying is, is that you have to, before you criticize somebody and say, well, this is now the, the, a new universal truth, to go, no, there's no such thing as that. You, you, it's 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 uh, experienced in a different way depending where you come from and there's a background and there's a history. But there is this age of outrage we're living in right now that mm -hmm. feels, seems to just want to end the conversation yeah. before it can even really absolutely happen. I totally, I totally agree. But you know, I'm 60, 64 years old. Right. I'm an old fart now, <laughs> so I, I probably you know I, I probably represent the old world or the old way of seeing things. But but I mean. I mean, it's 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 difficult because a lot of the very loud voices in all of this are very young voices, and I I wouldn't dare to say unexperienced voices because they have the experience that they have in the very specific thing, and uh, and the more I was radical when I was very young, and, and I go okay, and with time I kind of softened some things, and I understood because I traveled because I got to work with other cultures and I got to. So I have the impression that, you know, we have to... I feel like I knew you when you were young by watching 887. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> or at least part of your childhood. Yeah, part of yeah, yeah. my childhood, but not my, yeah, not right. my teenage not years. Teenage they're, 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 they, were, they were tougher. Right, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you put a lot of heart into this new theater space in mm -hmm. Quebec. In fact, when I was in Quebec City just before the pandemic, and we were uh, touring around with a, a guide, and they were pointing out the various Robert Lepage sites that I needed to oh, see and really? places where you work and so on. But uh, it had to close, of course, during the, yeah, during the pandemic. pandemic. And, and uh, well, it opened on and off because in Quebec we had different uh, right. We went through different. We had we had curfews, which right. you guys didn't. didn't have. That sure. was another thing. And sometimes the theaters were open at 50-50, and we had an eight o'clock curfew. <laughs> so how do you manage that? <laughs> I mean, we had all these things. But yeah, but but th this being said, yeah, we we we. we the, the theater opened uh, for six months, and then it was a pandemic for two years. So, right, so, and, and so now you're reopening again. Now we're reopened, and things are back to almost normal. But uh, and that must feel good to. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine you put a lot of time and effort into imagining what this place yeah, I should think, be and could yeah, be. Yeah, the thing is, that as long as it's local or national interests, what you present, that's one thing. You could always kind of get back on, on your feet quickly, but it's all the international stuff that we were supposed to greet, that we're supposed to show, uh, and, 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 and we were all supposed to also tour a lot and all that. The, the pandemic ha has damaged that a lot, and it's going to take more time for that to kind of come back to, to normal. I think there were festivals are... are, are uh, uh, just starting to find just starting to find their, their yeah. footing uh, yeah. in that because and with what's going on in, in Europe right now and all that it's uh, that I mean I, I, I spent um, I spent part of October all of November and part of December in Moscow I, I did Master in Margarita at the Theatre of Nations there and I have like a shitload of friends and actors that I know that I've been collaborating with for the past 15 years in Moscow and now I'm here I am saying you know Boycott everything Russian, and I guess it's it's a horrible situation. So it's a lot of hard left turns. Abs days. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So um, 
it, it's, I don't think it's comfortable mm -hmm. for, for anyone to think of it. I mean, you know, you don't want to be painting with uh, one brush, and we know absolutely. there's a huge population that's suffering as well. Absolutely, it's absolutely. Very, very difficult. Um, Robert Lepage, I am so glad you're back here in Toronto, and, and I never miss one of your productions, and uh, I never quite know what the experience uh, will be. So thank you so much for being with us and bringing us to pleasure. Toronto. Really. The Library at Night, created by Robert Lepage, presented by Lighthouse Immersive and the Luminato Festival Toronto. You can experience it through April 18th, lighthouseimmersive.com, and it's been a real pleasure to uh, be with you. My name is Mark Wigmore, and thank you for being with us.